Well, good morning. My name is Matt Stone. I'm the lead pastor here at Mount Pisgah Church, and I'm honored to be with you in worship today. Uh, I want to say a quick word about Father's Day. I know for some of us, this is an incredible day. Pastor Ricky Brown, this is his first uh, Father's Day, so celebrate with him when you have a chance. There may be some others in the same position. Uh, for some of us uh, with teenagers in the house, we're hanging on for dear life. I mean, hypothetically speaking, not out of personal experience. I'm just saying some of us might be hanging on for dear life as fathers. Uh, for some of us, we've moved into kind of a new season of fatherhood. And frankly, for some of us, this isn't uh, the most joyful day as we mourn the loss of fathers or uh, the loss of uh, a relationship with fathers. What seems to be true is that Father's Day can be a mixed bag. Here's what I want you to hear. Whether today is a celebration for you, or a confusing day for you, or a mourning kind of day for you, your church is here for you, right? This is what we do. We celebrate together, uh, we seek the right path forward together, and we mourn together. That's part of what it means to be in community. I want you to know that we're here for you, regardless of what this day looks like, uh, because the truth is, we can all celebrate Father's Day to a degree, as we give thanks to our Father in Heaven who is a father to all of us. Whatever our earthly father situation looks like, we can, thank, we can give thanks to and praise a God who is our Father in heaven. So, uh, happy Father's Day to all of you. We're in the second week of our series called True-ish. Right? Last week we looked at, at the story in Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we realized that the story that happens in the furnace is really only part of the story. That is an important part of the story. It's not the only part of the story. It may not even be the most important part of the story. What we saw from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was a deep conviction and commitment to live the life that God had called them to set out, had called them to live. Right? God provides the path to the good life. Uh, that That is the law. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were committed and convicted that that was the way of life they they needed to live, whether other people were living that way of life or not. They were so committed to it, they were willing to give their lives to it. And so we explored the reality that as followers of Jesus, we will look different, and that's okay. If we don't look different, it's not that God suddenly hates us. That's more of a sign to kind of come back home, right? If our lives look the same as everybody else around us, I'm preaching last week's sermon again. I'm about to get excited about it. We better move on to this week's. But anyways, if our lives don't look different than the world around us, what we learn from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is it may be time to reconsider the way we're engaging our life and the world around us. So this week, we're moving on to what is maybe the most famous story in the Bible, maybe except for the whole Jesus thing. This might be the most famous story in the Bible, and that makes it a double-edged sword. It's the most famous story in the Bible for a reason, and that's good. We're going to look at that. But because we've heard this story so many times and in so many different contexts, whether you grew up in church or not, you're familiar with at least the outline of the story, and familiarity breeds uh, contentment, right? Familiarity breeds a kind of laziness that says, well, I've heard this story before, Uh, I've heard this story a lot, I already know this story, I already know the point, so let's move on. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. Slow the story down. If you're super familiar with it, if if you've studied it a million times before, I'm willing to bet that God still has something to say to you for this season of your life, for this day in your life. I'm willing to bet that there is something in the story of David and Goliath that will speak to you if we will but slow down long enough to hear it. So that's where we're headed this morning. And and the truest version of the story is essentially... David beats Goliath, right? And that's the entire story. The little guy beats the big guy. That's the true-ish version of the story. It's not wrong. It's just not the full story. But we've made that the full story. The little guy beats the big guy. That's why uh, the 1980 U.S. men's hockey team beating the Soviet Union. That's the David and Goliath story. But here's the challenge. I think there's probably something more in this story than a great sports analogy. There is something more profound in it for us. There is something deeper in it for us. There is something that shapes our lives in this story. That's why it's one of the most famous stories in Scripture. There's a reason. It's a classic. Uh, my, my wife always says classics are classics for a reason. This is one of those examples. So the question is, what is it? If it's not just the little guy beats the big guy, then what else is in this story for us? So we're going to spend our entire morning in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I want to encourage you to turn, if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Samuel 17. That's where we'll be. Uh, if you have your phones, you can turn to it on your phones as long as you don't watch the U.S. Open. I'm coming for you if you do. Uh, don't tell me anything about it. 
So uh, 1 Samuel 17 is where our story takes place. Two chapters before that, we hear that, um, uh, that Saul is no longer God's chosen king. Here's what happened. Uh, Saul was the first king in Israel. He was tall, dark, and handsome. Those were the qualifications. And so he's the first king of Israel. He does okay for a minute. And then in 1 Samuel 15, he really fumbles the ball. So you're going to have to go back and read that story. It's a fascinating story. And we'll say that for another sermon on another day. In 1 Samuel 16, so the very next chapter, we hear that God is choosing a new king. And this new king's name is David. He's a young guy. He's the youngest of eight brothers. He grew up in Bethlehem. His dad's name is Jesse. And he is a man after God's own heart. If the qualifications for Saul were that he was tall, dark, and handsome, in other words, he looked like a king, then the qualifications for David were he was a man after God's own heart. He didn't look like a king, but he was a king after God's own choosing. So that's where we pick up the story in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Saul is still the king, but David is anointed to be the next king. And what we hear as chapter 17 opens is that the Philistine army is on the move. And I want to take a moment to land this story in solid dirt. Again, we've heard it so many times that it tends to reside in the realm of fiction or in, in like another realm altogether. We, we don't often, in, often remember that this story actually happened on real dirt. So I want to show you where this happened, not only to remind you that it actually did happen, but also because the location of this battle ends up making a difference. It's part of the subtext of the story that we sometimes miss because we're not as familiar with the geography of the promised land. So we have a map of Israel up on the screen, right? So on the left-hand side, you have the Mediterranean Sea. On the right-hand side at the top, you can see the Sea of Galilee, and the Jordan River flows south of the Sea of Galilee to that big body of water on the bottom right of your screen, which is the Dead Sea. So this is the land of Israel. And what you can see in the middle, right, between the Mediterranean Sea and between the Jordan River is that streak of green that runs north-south kind of like a spine through central Israel. This is the central hill country. It's incredibly important for ancient Israel because it provides for their, not only for their economic security, it provides for their strategic security. In other words, that hill country keeps armies from invading Israel. And that's a really important thing if you're an ancient country. It's a really important thing today. So the central hill country is right there. I want to zoom in, because that's an important part of the story. I want to zoom in to where exactly our story unfolds today. And you can see right there on the, on, on the left-hand side, you still have the Mediterranean Sea just in the top right corner or the top left corner. On the bottom right corner, you have the Dead Sea. So that's where we are. And what we hear in the opening verses of 1 Samuel 17 is that the Philistine army has come in from the coastal region. That's where they live. They've come into the interior of Israel, and they've made camp between Soko and Azekah. Now, we've got those on the screen too, I think. Uh, now look, if you're not a map person, I promise to you I'm almost done. But it's Father's Day. You're going to have to give me this, okay? I just get too excited about it. I think it's too cool. I'm a huge nerd. Deal with it. Just I'm almost done. I just wanted you to know there's hope. We're almost done with the maps. So the Philistine army makes camp between Soko and Azekah, and they're right on the edge of a place called the Elah Valley, which we've also got uh, uh, marked on that map in that bright green color. The Elah Valley is where our story unfolds. This is where Israel, where Saul is going to lead the Israelite army to the eastern side of the Elah Valley to meet the Philistine army who's camped between Soko and Azekah. And just for kind of scale, because I think it's important, I want you to see where Bethlehem and Jerusalem are. They're only five miles away. Bethlehem is only five miles away from the Elah Valley. All of that is to say this. When the Philistine army moves to this particular location, it represents an existential crisis for Israel. But don't think in geopolitical terms. This isn't about the nation state of Israel. This is about the promises of God. That's what is threatened by the Philistines moving in. Right? In Genesis chapter 12, one of the things that God promises Abraham is not only I'm going to make your descendants as numerous as the stars, I'm going to give you a land to live in. He also says, through you, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth. The fulfillment of that promise, by the way, is Jesus who invites the entire world into the kingdom of God. So the promise is, through Abraham, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth. When the Philistine army moves to this particular location, they are on the cusp of overrunning Israel. They are on the cusp of conquering Israel, which means they are on the cusp of destroying the promise 
that God made to Abraham 800 years before this story happened. That's the threat. And when Saul goes out to meet the threat, he does not see what's happening. They are so close to losing not their land, but the promises of God, and they don't recognize it. So when Saul leads the army out there, here's what they see when they first get out there. It says that a man named Goliath is waiting for them. And I just want to read, uh, I want to read the description of Goliath, which is not in Acts chapter 9, as it turns out. That's the wrong passage. We're over in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And remember this, Goliath is the perfect war machine. Here's what I mean. This is in verse 4. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. It's about nine feet tall. That's normal. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he, uh, he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. Friends, that's 125 pounds of armor. How much does this kid weigh? He's carrying 125 pounds of armor on his body. He had greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. I don't know how long that is, but I'm going to guess it's really big. This spear is very, very long. Here's how I know it's very long. It says that uh, the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. That's 15 pounds. The tip of his spear weighed 15. I don't think I could throw 15 pounds 15 feet, but that was the tip of his spear. And it says that he has a shield bearer that went before him. Dude has so much armor, so much weaponry on him that he has no limbs left to hold his shield. So this poor guy's job is to just stand in front of Goliath, the most terrifying and frightening human that's ever existed, and hold the shield. Good luck, buddy. So that's what Saul finds when he walks out onto the battlefield in the Valley of Elah on the cusp of the promises of God being destroyed. And then Goliath says this, hey guys, I have an idea. How about instead of my army fighting your army, how about if I fight somebody from Israel, just one person? And if I win, then you guys serve me. And if you win, then we'll serve you. And it feels absurd to our ears, right? Who would agree to that, first of all? It feels ridiculous. But second of all, there's a subtext there. There's something more important happening underneath that conversation that we miss because we don't often meet neighboring tribes on a battlefield uh, and challenge their champions to a death to the duel, right? That's not part of our experience. But for the ancient world, here was what was actually happening. Goliath wasn't just challenging the best warrior in Israel. Goliath was challenging the God of Israel, right? This champion's duel was a common way in the ancient world for tribes to settle a battle, Because what they believed was it wasn't just the champion from one tribe fighting the champion from another tribe. It was the gods of the one tribe fighting the gods of the next tribe. When Goliath steps out onto the battlefield and says, hey, I want to fight your best guy. What he's saying is my God is stronger than your God. That's what he's saying to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what he's saying to the God who created the heavens and the earth. That's what he's saying to the God who brought Israel out of Egypt. That's what he's saying to the God who brought Israel through the wilderness and into the promised land. My God is stronger than your God. This is what Saul walks into. And all eyes turn immediately to the king who was prepared for this moment, who was called to this moment to do exactly what Goliath is asking. Do you know what Saul's response was? He says, um, uh, have you seen that guy's helmet? It's way better than my helmet. Have you seen his javelin? It's huge. It's better than mine. Have you seen his sword? It's better than mine. Have you seen his armor? It's better than mine. Have you seen the greaves on his shins? They're better than mine. What Saul sees when he walks out is no chance. There's no world in which I'm going out there. So as all eyes are turning to Saul, waiting for some word of encouragement, right? Waiting for for some act of courage, waiting for some plan of action, 
what they find from Saul is a deafening silence. An utter refusal to move forward. And a man who has been conquered by fear. And he says, no way. For 40 days, Goliath comes onto the field of battle and challenges not only the promises of God, but challenges God Himself. And for 40 days, Israel, the people of God, the people who have already been delivered from Egypt by God, for 40 days, the people of God do nothing. And that's when David finally comes onto the scene. And what we hear is David is in in Bethlehem, right, five miles away. He's tending the sheep because that was still his job. He's the youngest son. Uh, He's tending the sheep in the wilderness. His dad, Jesse, calls him out of the the shepherding uh, business, and he says, hey, I need you to be my Uber driver. And so he sends David from Bethlehem to the Elah Valley with some bread for his brothers. And he also, (laughs) this is my favorite part, he also sends David with a charcuterie board. You go back and read the Bible. It says, Jesse sent David with 10 cheeses, I, like probably some hot honey and maybe three kinds of salami as well and some of the bacon that we have out there, right? David is delivering food for his dad from Bethlehem to the Elah Valley because his brothers are there fighting and his dad wants to curry some favor with his brother's boss. He sends him with a charcuterie board of 10 different cheeses. David arrives, sees and hears Goliath, and maybe more importantly, sees Israel flee in panic and terror and do absolutely nothing, and David is indignant. He can't believe what he is seeing. Remember, this is a kid. He's not even old enough to be in the battle, but he shows up and says, what is happening out here? And then I love how his mind works. He says, well, now, wait a minute. What happens to the guy who goes and fights and beats Goliath? And the guys tell him, all the guys who gather around, they tell him, well, you're going to get rich and you get to marry the king's daughter. And so David's like, okay. So uh, here's what he says in response to watching Israel do nothing. He says, who is this? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And, And that's, again, weird language for us. Here's what he's saying. Who is this guy who has no idea who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who does he think he is? That he can stand up to the God who made the heavens and the earth? That he can stand up to the guy who defeated Pharaoh? Who does he think he is? And I love David's brother. His name is Eliab. David's brother comes along and says, you're killing me. You're embarrassing the family and you are killing me. And David's response, I love this. He says, what did I do now? I just asked a question. That's in verse 29. It's literally what he says. I love that. Here's why I love it. Because that's exactly what a brother would say, right? That, it's such a human thing. Sometimes David hovers above the earth, right? He's like an otherworldly, not even a human person, but he's fighting with his brothers, which I love. It brings no value to my sermon, but I wanted to point it out to you because it makes me chuckle. When Saul hears what David is saying, He invites David into his camp, right? So remember, this is Saul, tall, dark, handsome, first king of Israel's history, and in comes David, who's short. Maybe he's kind of cute. It depends on how you read the text. He's never been in a battle or done anything of value or consequence. David shows up in front of Saul and says, hey, you've got a problem. I'm going to fix it. I'll go fight Goliath, and I'm going to defeat him. And Saul's response is, huh? You're tiny, he's huge, and he's been fighting since he was younger than you. What are you going to do? Listen to David's response. This is where it starts to become clear, friends, that David sees the world differently than Saul sees the world. And this is part of the power of the story that we've got to tap into. David sees what's happening around him through different eyes than the eyes that Saul uses to see what's happening in front of him. Here's David's response. This is 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17 and verse 34. David says to Saul, your servant used to keep, he's talking about himself, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and I struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. But if it turned against me, then I'd catch it by the jaw, strike it down and kill it. Ah, 
I don't know if you've ever tried to catch a bear by the jaw. It's something different. This kid is different. I'd catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it, is what David says. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine is going to be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. And David goes on to say, the Lord, this is where we see his eyes are different, the Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, the Lord will save me from the hand of this Philistine. That's the difference. There's a fundamental difference between how Saul sees Goliath and how David sees Goliath. When Saul looks out onto the battlefield, he sees Goliath's size, he sees his strength, he sees the technology and the weaponry that he has, and Saul's question is, how can I win? His stuff is better than my stuff. What am I going to do? I don't have enough to win that battle. But when David looks at Goliath, he doesn't fall into that comparison trap because he's not comparing Goliath's size and strength and weaponry to what he has. He's comparing everything that Goliath has to everything that God is. And he says, I'm not going to fight this battle. It's God who will deliver me. It is God who will save me. Just as God has done in the past, what David rightly sees is all that preparation work early in his life with the lions and the tigers and the bears and then the oh my, all of that preparation work was actually God's hand at work in his life. David sees that when he goes out onto the battlefield, it's not going to be David who wins the day. He's not fighting out of his own strength. He's fighting out of the strength of God. So the question that David asks is different. If Saul asks, how can I win? David is looking at this saying, how can I lose? How can I lose? The God who created the world goes into battle with me. How can I possibly lose this battle? For Saul, he is the star of his own show. And that's the danger for most of us. For David, he rightly sees that God is the primary actor in his life. God is the one who prepared David. God is the one who called David into this moment. And God is the one who will deliver David through the battle. That's the power of this story. Saul, in response to David's declaration, Saul says, Good luck, buddy. Which, think about what he's putting on the line. He's putting on the line not only the safety and security of his entire country, his entire tribe. He's putting on the line the safety and security of God's promises. Saul's response was, good luck. Here's my lame armor. Maybe it'll work for you. So David puts it all on, and he looks like the kid from a Christmas story, right? He can't move his arms and his legs, and he wisely sees that he can't be somebody else. He wisely sees that he shouldn't try to be Saul because he's not Saul. And also, he shouldn't try to be Goliath because he is not Goliath. He takes all of Saul's armor off. He grabs a few stones from the riverbed. They're two or three inches in diameter. They weigh a quarter of a pound to a half a pound. He grabs five of them, puts them in his pouch, takes his sling, and walks out onto the battlefield. And as soon as he walks out on the battlefield, it's Goliath's turn to be indignant. Goliath looks at this puny kid, and says, are you serious? This kid's going to fight me? Do you see how big I am? What are, what are you throwing sticks at me? Is that your plan? And then Goliath curses not only David. Goliath is the one who curses David's God. And that's a problem. Right? The sanctity of God's name is sometimes lost on modern ears. In the ancient world, to curse a god was not only an act of deepest offense, it was an act of war. That's what Goliath does. He declares war not only on David, he declares war on God himself. And I want you to hear how David responds to that act of war, that declaration of war. This is in verse 45. David said to the Philistine, you come at me with sword and spear and javelin, 
But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this very day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down. Now, listen, this is the part of the story that when we're telling it to our kids, we usually stop right there. I'm going to read what's in the Bible. If you have a problem, it's not me. I'm just reading what's in the Bible. So this is what happens next. It says, I will strike you down. I'm going to cut your head off too. And I'll give you the, and I'll give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the earth. David is painting a dark scene here. But listen to the so that. Any time in Scripture that you run into those two words, so that, you ought to stop, you ought to reread what just came before and get ready for the explanation. The reason David is about to defeat Goliath is so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that, the, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord doesn't save by sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. What David doubles down on is he's not even the one that's going out to fight. That it is God who fights the battle for him. He runs onto the battlefield. Goliath prepares for battle and his poor little shield bearer. We never hear what happens to this guy, but that poor little guy runs in front of Goliath. David, while he's still far off, takes one of those rocks, puts it into his sling, and with one turn of a sling... You could get that rock moving at 100 miles an hour, which makes it deadly at 100 yards away. Goliath was expecting hand-to-hand combat. David is launching intercontinental ballistic missiles. And David wins the day. Exactly what David said would happen is exactly what happened. God gives David the victory. Friends, the power of the story is not the little guy beats the big guy. That happens every day. That's not the power of the story. It's an interesting part of the story. It draws our attention. It draws our imagination into the story. But the power of the story is David's conviction. It's David's trust. It's David's faithfulness that God has prepared him, that God is calling him, and that God will deliver him. That's the difference between David and Saul. God prepared Saul. God called Saul. God would have delivered Saul, but Saul never stepped onto the field. And that's what David did. Because he believed that just as God had been with him in the past, God would be with him yet again. That, brothers and sisters, is the power of this story. Too often, we live Saul kinds of lives. Right? Too often when we're faced with Goliath, whatever Goliath is in your life, by the way, you don't need me to tell you what Goliath is. You already know what it is. Whatever that thing is that causes you fear, whatever that thing is that causes you anxiety, whatever obstacle or person that is, uh, that is standing between you and the life that God has called you to live, you know what that is. You don't need me to tell you what it is. But when we see them, too often we live Saul lives and we allow our fear, our lack of vision, and a lack of trust to keep us on the sidelines. Or if we were going to church it up, we allow our fear, our lack of vision, our lack of trust to keep us in the pew. Too many of us live Saul lives when we have a chance to be David. When we have a chance to be David, prepared by God, called by God, delivered by God. Brothers and sisters, We're not a Saul kind of church. We're a David church. It's time to to leave the pews. It's time to, to stop standing on the sidelines and simply step on the field, knowing that it's not our strength that's going to win the battle. Knowing that it's not because we're just great people that the world around us is going to change. The victory will be had. The world will be changed. Because we simply make ourselves available to God to be used. Because we step onto the field and say, God, use us to change the world. Use us that the world might come to know you. Too many of us have lived all kinds of lives. Friends, it's time to leave the sidelines. It's time to leave the pews and get back into the world. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks this morning.
for David's story, for his example, for his courage, for his faith. We give you thanks for his eyes, God, that could see Goliath for what he was. No match for you. Oh God, as we encounter our own individual or, or community Goliaths, as we run into things that cause fear, that, 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 that cause anxiety, as we run into things that cause despair, oh God, I pray that we might see those challenges the way David saw them, the way your son sees them. Help us to see with your eyes, oh God. And allow a kingdom vision to pull us into the game. To pull us into the world. Not run from the world because we're scared. But draw us into the world. That we might be used by you. That we, having been transformed by the power of your spirit, might be used to invite the world into that same kind of transformation. Use us, O God. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.